and grace. We're in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Romans 1, 1 through 7. I'm going to ask you to rise to your feet as always and pay tribute to the reading of God's word. Greetings of glory and grace, Romans 1, 1 through 7. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we come this morning, and God, as we share in your word, I pray that as we see through the eyes of Paul and through the life of Paul, and inspired by the Spirit, that God, it would challenge us and, and, and to understand and to see plainly that Paul introduces to the church of Rome, Jesus Christ. I pray today, dear Heavenly Father, that we in our own lives uh, would see uh, Jesus Christ for who he truly is. And God understand that Paul, who was a persecutor of the church, how his life had been radically changed because of Jesus. And for Paul, that Jesus Christ is real. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That Jesus Christ uh, is the Savior of the world. And God, that we can put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Just be with us, watch over, care for, and keep us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As Paul always done, Paul had a greeting to his audience. And most of the time, I, on Wednesday night, we have shared that, that Paul always wanted people to have this grace. Because grace had radically changed the life of Jesus Christ, as it has for many of us. Now, uh, Paul comes and, and he gives this greeting that is expressed. And he, again, this greeting that Paul shares. And my, my hope is today that you see Jesus Christ as Paul has seen Jesus Christ. Uh, in, in the fact that, that Paul is convinced in the deity and all of Jesus Christ, how he was human, how he was God, how he was the Savior of the world. And so Paul comes to the church at Rome and he writes the greeting and he expresses this greeting in verse 1 this way. He, his greeting is like this. He himself, greeting the church, puts it this way in verse 1. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated uh, unto uh, the gospel of God. So he, he mentions some things there like he is a servant. He mentions a thing there like he is an uh, apostle. He mentions some things there like he is separated uh, unto the gospel of, of God. I am certain that, that many of those that were in Rome had heard about Paul. But here he takes a moment to introduce himself, not calling himself uh, uh, just by the name Paul, but giving a very description of not who Paul is, but what he has become in his life. Now watch this. Paul would share with us, and, uh, and, and what you can read by Paul sharing this is that Paul was submitted. So we're going to look at Paul's submission. He says there that he was a servant of Jesus Christ. A servant of Jesus Christ. And in order to be a servant, Paul, the word that is used there is a bond slave, that he has actually become a servant, a bond slave. He reveals that he is a slave of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, that he is bound in service to Jesus Christ. Now, what I want you to know about Paul is this, is that he does not say that in resentment. It is not a bad thing in Paul's life to be a servant of Jesus Christ. It is not derogatory in any way. It is not something that has 
bummed him out there. No, no. As a matter of fact, Paul would share uh, that I hope that you and I would see that when we are a servant of Jesus Christ, when we are, are bound in service to him, and when we are, are, are under the authority of Jesus Christ, it is a position of great joy. Paul had reached the pinnacle of success as a Pharisee, no doubt. But, uh, but yet he rejoiced in his salvation that it happened in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, this is what Paul is saying. I give up all the worldly success. I give up everything. See, Paul was on the pinnacle as a Pharisee, but now he becomes a, a servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. He said, I give up everything that is a, of honor of myself in order that I might follow, uh, that I might submit my life in service to the Lord. Surely this challenges us. Surely this challenged uh, the Roman readers who read this uh, uh, to submit to service to the Lord. Listen, we need to surrender to him and to, the Bible says, serve the Lord with gladness. And so it made Paul glad. He was happy to be this servant. He was happy to be under, under the, the submission and the, the authority of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is telling the people there at Rome, is what he's telling us. Here, listen, if you want your life to be a life of joy, then you need to surrender to Jesus Christ. Now Paul goes on and he says this. He says that I am not only a slave, and, and that is his submission. He is submitted under the authority of one, but he is in service. Look at Paul's service that he brings about there in that first one. He says that he was called to be an apostle. The word apostle means to be sent out, to be sent out. And so he had not sought this position of himself. It's, it's kind of like I always said, I didn't choose to be a pastor. God chose me to do that. I understand where Paul is on this. He didn't, see, he didn't seek out this position for himself. But here's the thing. God has a desire of a work in you and a work for you and a work that you can do. And so we find here that Paul said, my work that is to be done is the work of an apostle. God had chosen Paul, called him to be this apostle. Paul knew in the, in the depth of his very soul that he was sent of the Lord to carry the good news, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, the, the good news of this glorious gospel to a world that was lost and dying. Let me ask you this morning. What is your service to the Lord? What is it that God has called you under the authority that you are under a slave of Jesus Christ? What is it that God has called you to position yourself in, in, in Christ, but, but to position yourself in a way that God can use you? You know, it's interesting to me, and maybe this is just me, that Paul noted in his life that he was a servant first, and then he wanted to talk about being an apostle. Notice the order that he gives there. It was under the authority that he becomes an apostle. What we need to do is get under the authority of God. What we need to do is get rid of self. What we need to do is get rid of self-desires and self-wants and really seek God and the things that God wants in our life so that we can be like Paul. Yes, we are a servant, but there is a position and a work that God had for Paul, and it only happens because he was submitted to to God. Amen. I've shared again that obedience brings blessings. And Paul would say the same thing about, uh, about his life, about being a servant of the Lord, uh, and about being an apostle. He, listen, he well understood what submission was in his life. He understood that submission always preceded service. What a lesson there is for us. Many, listen, many want the glory of position without the sacrifice of submission. I'll say that again. Again, many want the glory of position. Paul was in the position of being an apostle. Many want the glory of, a, of position without the sacrifice of submission. 
And if you're truly going to be in the position where God wants you, it only comes by that submission. And so uh, we see Paul's service by being that servant of God. Now, notice this. Paul says that he was separated. Paul was separated. He was separated from his, uh, from his being a Pharisee. Matter of fact, in that verse 1, he uses this phrase. He says, he says, I am a, what, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. I am called by God to be an apostle. And then he says this in verse 1, I am separated unto the gospel of God. It wasn't an accident. I want you to understand that Paul, it wasn't an accident that he becomes an apostle. It wasn't an accident that, 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 that the, 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 the mapping out of Paul's life was done by Paul. Well, Paul, no, it was it was uh, that God had chosen him to be an apostle. In other words, in his life, there was a great work that had been done in Paul's life from a persecutor of the church to the apostle to be separated, listen, to be separated from his past life, to be separated from what he was, to be able to go and share this wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. And so... He had been separated to carry this gospel. The good news unto Gentiles. And matter of fact, Paul understood that his realm was not just Gentiles, but an entire world. That Paul was on a, on a world stage set by God. I, 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 I think we all would agree that there is a need for separation in our lives today away from the world. I, I think when I, I see the world that we live in, our prayer ought to be that we can truly be that separate of the world. Oh, we got to be in the world, but we ain't got to look like the world. And so we will never accomplish all the Lord's desire of us while we desperately try to hold on to the former life, to the worldly things of life. It was when, when, when Paul's life is radically changed, from, radically changed from what he used to be that now he is separated from that life, from the world, so that God can use him in a mighty, mighty way. You and I need to get rid of the worldly things in our life. We need to separate our life. We need to separate from the formal life. We need to separate. You know, that's what God does. That's what salvation does. Uh, we who once was a far off from God, who changes our lives radically so that we can then uh, uh, forget our former life. We're a new creature. It's not, again, it's not us just changed. It's we're a new creature. Our former life has gone away. We must be willing to die for our desires and seek to serve the Lord. And when we do that, God will separate us from the world and the lust thereof and have us where we can truly serve God in the way that God would have us do. We can have a Paul transformation in our life. So Paul goes on and says this. He says, but I, all of this that happened in my life, to be a slave to be apostle, to be separated from my former life. Anybody here today need that? I'm telling you, it comes by salvation. To, to separate you from your old life, to separate you from the devil, to separate you from, 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 from listen, from all that sin in your life, it only comes by, uh, by Jesus Christ and the gospel. And that's where Paul goes next. Paul shares in the glory exalted. Watch this. Paul does not come to seek him uh, to, to exalt himself. Paul seeks to exalt the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ who radically changed his life and that he wants Rome, he wants the Romans to know that Jesus is who he says that he is because he had made a difference in the life of Paul, once a great Pharisee, but now an apostle preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, he, he wants to take a moment. And here's what he does. And introducing himself, yes, that's what he done. But, but there's nothing like what he's about to do. He says, I want to really introduce to you, though, the one who made me who I am. I want to introduce you to Jesus Christ. Hey, Rome, Rome probably had heard, or maybe some people in Rome had heard about Jesus Christ. But Paul says, I want you to understand by my own account. I want you to understand by my life who Jesus is. And so that Paul's going to make not an argument, but a fact of the life of Jesus Christ. And it is his life is the greatest example of the work of Jesus Christ in, in, in a person's life. 
And so here's what he says. He starts off and he says, this Jesus Christ is the one that was prophesied. The prophecy. Look at this, the prophecy. Because in verse 2, Paul writes here, he says, which was what? Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. Now again, this gospel is the good news of Jesus. And this good news that, that Paul is sharing is the one that the prophets of old wrote about. How this one that was going to come, he was going to be crucified and he was going to die. Well, that's nothing special about that. But there was going to be something different that the prophet said about this one. That he was going to raise from the dead. And so it was the crucifixion, the, 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 the death, the, the burial, and the, and the resurrection. Again, how did Paul know? Because Paul speaks to him on the road to Damascus. They have a conversation with Jesus Christ. Paul goes blind because Christ appears to Jesus to tell him all this. To tell him that he's an apostle. To say that you're going to go and you're going to preach. He had literally met Jesus Christ after Christ had been crucified. And so Paul is assuring you and I, he's assuring the reader of the fulfillment of the prophecy in, in Jesus Christ. That Jesus was the Christ. He, he is the one that the prophets had spoke of. He is the one that had been written of old. He is the one that the scripture has proclaimed from the very beginning words of God all the way until the end. The Holy Scripture had, had, has described this one. The Holy Scripture had talked about this one. The Holy Scripture has given everything about this one. And Paul says, I have met him. Jesus Christ is that one. Some may have been sitting there thinking, well, Jesus Christ was nothing more than a man. Jesus Christ was nothing more than flesh and, and, and blood. And, and they had heard of the man Jesus Christ. But again, Paul wanted to ensure them that he was the Christ. Every prophecy concerning his coming had been fulfilled. There was no need. Here's what Paul said. Here's what I want the world to hear what Paul said. There is no need to look for another one. He is the one. In your life today, there's no need to looking for something else. There's no need for looking for something else in your life. Jesus Christ is the one. He's the one that the prophet spoke of. He's the one that 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 that, that you know that prophecy was. He's the one of the of the Old Testament uh, scripture. He's the one of the New Testament scripture. He's the one that Paul had met in flesh and blood. Hear what I said. Paul then comes and talks about, yeah, I know there may be those who say, well, Jesus is nothing more than a man. And Paul says, yes, he is human. He is God in human form. He is flesh. He is flesh the way that we are, that Paul saw him. It's not some concept of mine. Verse 3, he says this. He says, concerning, watch this, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, he is the one, he's the son of which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Yes, he was flesh. Not sinful flesh, but yes, he was in human form. Why was that why why did that why was that a necessity? I have shared with you because God is an eternal God, you can't kill an eternal God. So there's no way to kill an eternal God. The only way that God could become sacrifice, he sends his son uh, who was God in the very beginning. Nothing was uh, created without him. And he takes on human uh, flesh because you can kill that flesh. You can kill the human form. Right? And so it was a necessity that he comes to be that sacrifice and that the only way that God could be that sacrifice was he had to die because the wages of sin is dead. Something has to die. So therefore, God was going to have to die. And so here's what he says. He says, yes, he was robed in a body of flesh. He was born, as we know of the scripture, of a virgin womb. He was of the lineage of the king on the earth, King David. However, he's king of kings and Lord of lords. Matter of fact, sin required a perfect sacrifice. In order for a, a, a atonement to be made, Jesus lived in the flesh 
uh, as a man, uh, uh, lived a perfect, sinless life in this body of flesh, and then he offers himself as the, uh, as the atonement to be made, uh, uh, the, the atoning sacrifice for sin. Let me share this with you. Maybe you never thought of it this way. But here's what Paul is giving us a glimpse into the humanity of Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to understand. Had there been no birth, there would have been no death. Had there been no death, there would have been no salvation for sin. So Paul said, yes, he was. But then Paul comes back and he clarifies in verse 4 that not only was he in flesh, but he was deity. He was God. In verse 4 he says this. And declared to be the son of God. Yes, his lineage was of the seed of David that give him the human sign. But notice that he was the son of God. And he says this. And by the way, I want you to understand this is a, a great thing with Paul. Paul said it's not just done that he's the son of God. But he is son of God with power. Look at verse 4. To be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So Paul says Jesus is like no one else. If you want to make him a mere man, you miss the boat. Yeah, he was a man, but he had no sin. He was a man, but he didn't live in flesh, the, the, the sinful flesh like mankind does. And then he comes back and he says, yes, and he is, he is deity, uh, which has been publicly revealed. It is not a secret. Christ did not hide himself. It is not a secret of his deity. Matter of fact, Paul says that it is his power that he comes with power, living a life of holiness, power, living a life of holiness, known on, that would be only known to God. Only one, because every and Paul could ask that question, have you ever sinned? And surely all those uh, in Rome would uh, give the affirmative. Uh, uh, have you ever broken the law? Surely those in Rome would have given the affirmative as you and I would say that we've sinned. And yet it is the power of God living a holy life that shows, listen, his life, his wisdom, his miracles, and his resurrection from the dead proclaim the power of Jesus Christ. That's why when Paul had the visitation of Jesus, the vision on the road to Damascus, he understood that power. He understands what, what the miracle. He understands the wisdom. He understands the resurrection of Jesus Christ that made him different from everyone else. So he says his power has been revealed. It has been seen in his life. It has been seen in his teachings, in his wisdom. It has been seen in how he died and how he rose from the dead. It has been seen in the miracles that he performed for those that were around him. So Paul wanted to affirm the fact that Jesus was without a doubt the Christ, possessing power, he possessed deity, he possessed his holiness, all of God the Father. And then Paul says this, and all of that leads to victory. All of that is victory. Verse 4, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the one thing that always defeats man is death. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And not only that, but Jesus Christ, by our faith and trust in him, gives us the ability to live life after this life. That we too might be raised in the newness of life. That literally, listen, he came to atone for sin and that he did, and that he did as, he, as he bled and he died upon the cross. What a perfect picture of the atonement. What is atonement? At one month with God. At one with God. And so we find the atonement allows us to be at one with God. However, if the cross had been the end, we would have been without hope. Paul said, but I met him. I met him after the cross. I met him after the grave. He Listen, had he not risen from the dead? Yeah, well, maybe God could have forgiven, gave us. 
Yeah. But there would be no hope of eternal life because of conquering death, he becomes life for us and gives us that eternal life by defeating death and the grave and that cross and that power, that victorious Jesus. Paul says he's the one. But here's the close of this. Paul says, but here's what I want you to know, grown. Here's what I want you to know, people, that all that I've shared about meeting my Jesus, he extends that to you. He gives that to you. When people say, do you believe that Jesus is the only way? Absolutely. Paul would agree, Jesus Christ is the only way. That it is the grace extended as he concludes his greeting. And again, this is just a greeting to Rome. He's setting the stage that I want you to meet Jesus. I want you to understand Jesus is real. I want you to understand Jesus is the only one that can save. I want you to understand that Jesus is the one the Old Testament wrote about. I want you to understand that Jesus is the one that the prophets prophesied. I want you to understand that every prophecy about Jesus Christ is found in the man Jesus Christ. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the one. He's the victorious one. And so he comes back and he says, he takes a moment to address that we sing about the amazing grace. How sweet the sound. I, I just tell you, Paul could sing this. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, could Paul say that on the road to Damascus? But in his life before that, was blind, but now I see. This wonderful grace of Jesus Christ. He is who he says that he is. And he does what he says he can do. He is the savior of the world. And he goes on and he says, let me, let me, let me show you the rendering of this grace. He says, by whom, look at verse 5, the first part of verse 5. By whom we have received grace. Paul, Paul says, by whom it is this man Jesus that I receive my grace. It is this man Jesus who I receive my apostleship from. The, the, the source and the foundation of the grace in my life. The source and the foundation of the apostleship. Paul is very aware of all that Christ had accomplished in his life. Uh, that Christ had accomplished for him, Paul the persecutor, who is now the preacher of the gospel. He knew apart from Christ that he would yet be in his sin. And apart from Christ, he would be lost. He would be condemned before God. Of the sinners, I was, I was, not am, I was the chief. Had it not been for Jesus Christ, he still would have been in that was. His was would become I am. He would not have received. Paul understood this glorious calling to share the good news. It was all of Jesus Christ and the work of Christ in his life. Listen, we too must recognize that all of grace comes by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. There is nothing else. The good news, listen, is by Christ alone. Christ alone provides for our salvation. It is him alone that can extend, uh, extend such grace. And so he said, here is the rendering of it. We have received it. He sent it, we have received it. But look at the realm of it. Paul says, I want you to see the realm, uh, the, the, the whole being of it. Verse 5, the latter part there, it says, For obedience to the faith among all nations. Paul said, hey, uh, uh, listen, church at Rome, it's just not, it's not me. And, and I understand you are a church. And I want you to understand that you can put your faith and trust in God. And you have, you, you are the church there. But hold on to that fact. Because the, the, the realm of his grace reaches uh, even, even to Rome and the whole world. Paul was, again, a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was one of the elite within Jerusalem. And yet he was totally lost without Jesus Christ. He was somebody as far as the Pharisees, but was a nobody without Christ. And he knew the significance of grace and what he had received. Paul realized this grace was not preserved just for him. And Paul understands it's not just preserved for the Jews because he's preaching it to the Gentiles and Gentiles are being saved. 
You know, we live a life that are uh, that's sheltered, no doubt, here where we live. We, we tend to think that everyone has heard of the gospel, and we think that everyone has driven by a church, or our people was raised in church, or they're familiar with the Bible. But, but here's, here's what Paul says. Hey, listen, not everybody's heard, and the gospel is good for every nation, for every tongue, for every people, for every person worldwide. This is what he said. Here's the recipient. Because Paul himself had been a recipient of this grace. Listen, to ver look at verses 6 and the first part of 7 there. He said, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus? Writing to the church of Rome. Hey, you, listen, put your faith in, you put your faith in trust. Hold on to your salvation. Know that what Christ has done in your life is real. Know that what Christ has done in saving you, there's no salvation by any other. You're saved to the uttermost. Among whom are you also the called of Jesus Christ to all that be in, in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. In the days to come, there's going to be many struggles in Paul's life for the church. The church at Corinth, the church at Philippi, the church at Ephesus. There's going to be many struggles for ahead for the believers. Knowing, uh, knowing Christ and salvation is not going to shield them from, from some of the tragedies of life. and It's not going to shield uh, uh, the Christian from adversity. But Paul knew their faith uh, is going to be tested, uh, no doubt. And, and they would hear much her heresy. And, and they're going to hear a lot of false doctrine. But listen, the Judaizers are going to whisper in their ear and tell them their salvation is nothing. And yet Paul wanted them to know that, listen, that they, it was an amazing fact that they were the people of God, the children of God. You're here today, listen, and you got struggles in your life. I want you to know God already knows that, but that has nothing to do with you being a child of the king. It's amazing to be a part of God's family. We have been made righteous, rightness with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we can, we can hold on to that. We, we, we have the blessed hope that Paul is sharing with Rome there of eternal life because of Jesus. Paul says, let me introduce you to Jesus. Let me introduce you to Jesus. In a life with, that is full of flesh, Paul says, here's one that came in flesh that you know sin. Let me introduce you to Jesus. In a world where mankind is afraid to die, Paul said, here's one that was crucified and died and raised uh, uh, from the dead and was victorious. Let me introduce you to Jesus. Paul said, in my own life, where I was a persecutor, where I was dirty and filthy and, and ugly and sin had encapsulated my life, Jesus' wonderful grace came and Save me. Let me introduce you to Jesus. When the world is whispering in your ear, let me introduce you to Jesus. When you're going through adversity, let me introduce you to Jesus. When, there, when your faith is being tested, let me introduce you to Jesus. Uh, uh, all who have trusted, Paul was said, Paul said, who have trusted in Christ and salvation, uh, realizing their need of a Savior, repenting of their sin and believing in faith, is secure. Let me introduce you to the man named Jesus. Secured in Jesus. Again, it's amazing to be considered to be a part of God's family. That we've been, we've, we've been recipients of such grace. And then here's what Paul does. He doesn't leave, here's where he closes in that verse 7. And he says, and I want you to have it. I, I've introduced you to Jesus and I want you to have that grace. I want you to see that grace. I want you to understand that grace. And so the request for grace. Paul literally makes a request for grace to those that he is writing to. Verse 7, the last part, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I want to comfort your heart. Listen, if you know Jesus today and he's your Savior, find comfort. Have comfort in your heart. Even when there's tragedy, even when there's struggle, find comfort in your heart. And be encouraged in your faith uh, because there's Jesus. He, he, he desired the, the church at Rome to experience the, the fullness of this grace and a grace and a peace that is available only from 
Jesus Christ. It has been said that grace is the cause and peace is the effect. And that is so true, no doubt. Grace is the cause, but peace is the effect within our life. God, grace always brings peace. In Paul's life, when he had struggled about his past, he finally found that peace in being a servant of God, a servant of Jesus Christ, and an apostle to go and preach the gospel to the nations, to every tongue, because Jesus is real. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we could come and we could share. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, today that each and every one of us can